Hello class, welcome to week five of lecture. Um, just a little bit of a recap on week four. So week four, all of your grades should be caught up and posted, and then also your exam one grade. Um, so exam one has been graded and should be accessible to you all at this time to view. Overall, um, great job on exam one. I did primarily go with a multiple choice fill in the blank true and false format um, and you all did very well with that. So great job on exam one. Um, keep in mind that that's largely how the structure of the exams will be moving forward. Um, there may be a couple of short response or essay questions um, thrown in as we go throughout the semester. But overall great job on exam one um, and at this point we're ready to get started with our week five lecture content. For week five, again, those of you that selected to purchase the check textbook, this will be chapter nine. So chapter nine is over determining the age, height, and weight of horses. This first lecture, I'm only going to go over determining age. Your second lecture this week will be over determining height and weight of horses. And then we will take this information and utilize it in lab on Wednesday. Um, since the university is closed on Monday and Tuesday, snow days, whether it's online or in-person classes, university closed Monday and Tuesday. As a result, I am going to extend your due date for all assignments this week until Friday at 11.59. So Friday at 11.59 p.m. is going to be when your week 5A, 5B, and supplemental assignment three, or excuse me, supplementals assignment four are going to be due. So instead of having 5A and 5B due on Wednesday prior to lab, these assignments are going to be due Friday at 11.59. And this is a result of university being closed on Monday and Tuesday. I will say um, if university is back in session on Wednesday, which is the current plan, if that is the case, we will um, meet for lab and it's going to be beneficial if you've already watched these lectures. So keep that in mind moving forward, um, but the due date is going to be Friday. So let's go ahead and get started with how to determine the age of horses and why that is important. In getting started with determining age, we first want to look at why is it important? Why is it important that we know the age of a horse? Um, so first, we're going to start that with how we identify different classes of horses based on age. And a few times, age and gender or age and sex are going to come into play. So young horses are referred to by their age oftentimes. Um, a young horse is going to be called a foal until it is weaned. So the time of birth until that foal is weaned, um, we're going to reference them as a foal. Um, oftentimes the term weanling is used for horses that are six months to one year of age. So that's going to be our weanlings. And then horses one to two years old may be called yearlings. And how original that as a two-year-old we often call these horses two-year-olds. Um, so all of these we can fairly easily follow. So foal is going to be birth until it is weaned. Um, weanling is going to be six months to one year of age. Yearlings are going to be um, one to two and horses that are two years of age are going to be two-year-olds. Um, moving on from there, when we look at a male horse, a male horse is going to be referred to as a colt until it is three years old and then it's going to be called a stallion. So male horses are colts up until they're three-year-olds and then stallions. Um, when we are gilding horses, so removing, um, removing their testicles, this is going to be what we refer to as a gilding. And then for our females, so a young female horse is called a filly until it reaches the age of three. And at this point, it is referenced as a mare. So that gives us a little bit of background on characterizing horses based on age and why it may be important to be familiar with age. 
Um, in addition, a horse's condition and training are more important than its age oftentimes. A prime age for a horse um, is going to be about seven to nine years old, but this is not necessarily the ideal age as horses frequently are active into their late 20s if they get the proper care. So very key in how long our horses are useful is if they get the proper care. If we're caring for them um, correctly, we're taking care of their bodies. Um, age is also going to be important for competitive events. So for racing or showing events, the foal's birth date or birthday is considered to be January, January 1st. And this is regardless of the actual month of birth um, during that year. So it doesn't matter if my foal is born on January 1st, January 30th, um, September 1st. It doesn't matter when that foal is born throughout the year. It is considered to be born on January 1st. So, for example, a foal that is born on April 1st of 2001 will be 10 years old on January 1st of 2011. Um, individuals who race or show are going to try to have foals that are born as close to January 1st as possible. But it's very, very key that we don't have a December baby because a December baby is going to be at a severe disadvantage. So, um, we want ideally that foal to be born right there around January 1st. Um, having a foal that is born near January 1 gives that horse the advantage for more growth than those born later in the year. Um, something else to keep in mind when we're looking at age being important for competitive events, um, there's also a number of shows and futurities that are influenced by the age of the horse. So another time that that is going to come into play. So as we begin to look at determining the age of our horses, the best way that we can determine the age of a horse is going to be to have good records. Absolute best way. Now when that foal is born, um, there's no guesswork. So having good records is key. Um, a record of a horse's birth is going to be required by breed registries. However, when a record of age does not exist, um, the teeth are going to furnish the best estimate of the age. So teeth are going to be our best estimate for aging a horse when good records are not available. Um, the art of determining the age of horses by the inspection of teeth um, has gone on for a number of years. It's very old. Um, it can be used with a considerable degree of accuracy in determining, the, in determining the age of young horses. The probability of error is going to increase as age advances and becomes a guesswork after a horse reaches 10 to 14 years of age. Um, stabled animals are going to tend to appear, young, appear younger than they are, so horses kept in barns are going to appear younger than they are when we evaluate their teeth, whereas those that are grazing sandy areas, such as range horses, are going to appear relatively older because of the wear on their teeth. So keep that in mind, even though the teeth are going to be the best estimate of age, um, different environmental factors are going to influence a horse on an individual basis. So stabled animals often tend to appear younger and then those horses that are grazing sandy areas may appear older because of the wear on those teeth. Age is going to be determined um, by a study of the 12 front teeth. So these 12 front teeth are what we reference as incisors. You can also see that in the diagram on the right hand side. The two central pairs both above and below are called central incisors. The fourth teeth adjacent to these two pairs are called intermediates, and the outer four teeth are des designated as corners. So those are going to be the 12 incisors. So we have our centrals, then we have our four intermediates, and then we have our four corners. The horse's canine teeth may appear midway between the incisors and molars. 
at four or five years of age in the case of gildings or stallions, but seldom appear in mares. So those canines are going to seldomly appear in mares. And then adult horses are going to have 24 teeth in total, or excuse me, 24 molar teeth, not total teeth, molar teeth, 24 molars. Before I dig too deep into determining age and how we're going to evaluate those teeth and different influences, I think we need to take a little bit of a step back and consider the anatomy and the functionality um, of the horse's teeth and the skull. Um, so specifically when we're looking or when we're considering horses, um, horses' teeth are going to continuously grow throughout their lifetime. The horse's upper jaw is going to be wider than the lower jaw, so that's important um, and anatomical uniqueness is that the upper jaw is going to be wider than the lower jaw um, and as a result the outside edges of the top teeth and the inside edges of the lower teeth are not going to get worn down and therefore may develop sharp points. These sharp enamel points can make it difficult for horses to properly chew their food and this can also lead to large particles in the digestive tract and cause the horse to be at risk for an impaction colic. In addition, the sharp enamel points can cause soreness in the horse's mouth and allow bacteria and toxins to enter the horse's bloodstream. These sores can also cause behavioral problems in horses, especially when a bit is placed in the horse's mouth. So this can help us to understand that as a result of our horse's teeth continuously growing and the anatomy, anatomy of the mouth, um, as a result of that, in addition to how that horse is going to chew when they're grazing and when they're consuming, um, consuming their feed, this is going to influence how those teeth wear. So when those teeth aren't worn evenly, um, this can cause discomfort to the horse in many, many different aspects of their life. Um, as a result, it's important to understand that proper dental um, examinations and treatments are among the most important, as well as the most neglected aspects of equine health care. So it's important that horses um, are having regular dentals. Well, when we look at later on in this lecture, when we look at abnormal tooth conditions, we'll touch a little bit again on those sharp points um, in addition to other things that we're going to look for in the horse's mouth um, and discuss why these, these dentals are going to be required, what we refer to as floating of the horse's teeth. So keep in mind some of that anatomy and the uniqueness of the horse and how it's going to influence it as we move through how to determine the age of the horse by evaluating the teeth. So there are going to be four key changes in the teeth that can be used to estimate the age of horses. Those four changes are going to be the occurrence of permanent teeth, the disappearance of cups, the angle of incidence, and then the shape of the surface of the teeth. So getting started with the occurrence of permanent teeth. Horses are going to have two sets of teeth, one that is temporary, one that is permanent. Temporary teeth may also be called baby or milk teeth, and temporary incisors tend to erupt in pairs at eight days, eight weeks, and then eight months of age. The four center permanent teeth appear as the animal approaches three years of age, the intermediates at four, and the corners at five. So this is what constitutes a full mouth. Next we have the disappearance of cups. So in the center of the tooth's surface, young permanent teeth are going to have deep indentures referred to as cups. Cups are commonly used as reference points in determining age. Those in the upper teeth are deeper than the ones below, so they do not wear evenly with the surface or become smooth at the same rate. 
a smooth mouth theoretically appears at 11 years of age. A few horse owners are going to ignore cups in the upper teeth and consider a nine-year-old horse smooth mouth. For the purpose of this class, we will consider a smooth mouth at 11 years of age. Um, complete accuracy cannot be ensured from studying cups, and this method is second in accuracy only to the appearance of permanent teeth in determining age. As cups disappear, a dental star will appear. The first, um, first, these dental stars will appear as narrow yellow lines in front of the central enamel ring, and then as dark circles near the center of the tooth in the more advanced stages. Um, next, we have the angle of incidence. So this is going to be our third key factor in determining age. The angle that is formed by the meeting of the upper and lower incisor teeth affords an indication of age. This angle of instance or contact is going to change from approximately 160 to 180 degrees in young horses to less than a right angle, so less than 90 degrees as the incisors appear to slant forward and outward in aging. As the slant increases, the surface of the lower corner teeth do not wear clear to the back margin of the uppers so that a dovetail notch or hook is formed on the upper corners at seven years of age. It may disappear in a year or two and reappear around 12 to 15 years and disappear again. This condition varies considerably between individuals, but most horses have a well-developed notch at seven. And then finally, our fourth key factor in determining age of horses is going to be the shape of the surface of the teeth. Um, the teeth are going to change substantially in shape during wear and aging. They are going to appear broad and flat in young horses, and they may be twice as wide as they are deep. This condition reverses itself in horses that reach or pass 20 years of age. From about 8 to 12, the back surfaces become oval and then triangular at about 15 years old. 20-year-old teeth may be twice as deep from front to rear as they are wide. I do not expect that you're going to memorize this chart. Um, however, it is a, a good overview of understanding the deciduous teeth or per se the baby teeth, um, what those different types of teeth are, at what point they will erupt, and then also the permanent teeth and at what point those teeth will erupt in the horse. So absolutely not a chart that you need to memorize, but I did believe it gives you a good overview. Um, once more, this is a diagram that is a good visual for seeing how a horse's mouth is going to change over time. Um, so we have an example of how a yearling or a one-year-old horse's mouth is going to look versus a horse that is 3, 5, 10, 15, and 20. So I'm not going to go into a significant amount of detail using um, the initial chart and then also this visual. However, in taking notes on aging the horse, it will be beneficial to reference these charts for information so that you have a full understanding. For this slide, I have included the different ages of the horse that I will mention and how you can determine a horse is at that age. The ones in red, make sure you know those. Um, the others are um, good to, a, to an overall understanding, but I won't touch you on those. The ones that are highlighted in red, make sure you know them. Um, when the horse reaches about two and a half years of age, it will lose its temporary central incisors, which are replaced with permanent teeth. During this time period, the horse gets two permanent molars on both sides of their upper and lower jaw. Around the age of three and a half, the horse will replace the temporary lateral incisors with the permanent ones, and they will now have four permanent molars on both sides of each jaw. So that's at three and a half 
that the horse will now have four permanent molars on each side of the jaw. At about four years of age, the last permanent molars erupt, giving the horse a total of six permanent molars on each jaw, which is at the age of four. Between four and a half to five years, the horse should have all of its permanent teeth. At this age, one is considered to be full-mouthed. At five to six years, the corner incisors are at full length and are now beginning to wear against each other. When the horse is six, the infundilament has gone from the central incisor tables and is becoming smaller on the lateral incisor tables and just starting to appear on the corner incisors. The dental star has also begun to appear on the central and lateral incisors. At the age of seven, there is a hook that begins to appear on the top corner um, incisors. However, horses also get a hook at the age of 11. So it's important to look at the slope and angle of the horse's teeth to determine the difference between one that is 7 and 11 um, based upon this hook that appears on the top corner incisors. A horse at the age of 7 should have teeth that are fairly upright and also at seven years, the tables will be oval in shape. At eight years of age, the hook will have disappeared and the tables will begin to take on a triangular shape. From this point on, aging the horse becomes very difficult to do by looking at their teeth alone. So from um, a foal um, to a horse that is eight years old, they are going to be easily identifiable to break into um, specific years. However, moving upward into nine and beyond, um, a range can be predicted, but pinpointing an exact age is going to be difficult. By the age of nine, the infundilament will have disappeared from the teeth. The Galvain's groove will begin to appear on the upper corner incisors and work its way down when the horse is around 10. So 10 is going to be the age at which the Galvain's groove is going to appear. Around the age of 11, the hook will appear again on the upper incisors. So we said that is a commonality between a horse that is 7 and a horse that is 11 is going to be the hook that will begin to appear on the upper incisors. At the age of 15, the Galvain's groove will be about halfway down the tooth and the tables will begin to become more rounded. Once the horse turns 20, the Galvain's groove will have reached the bottom of the tooth and the horse's teeth will now take on a sloped appearance. So the age of 20, the Galvain's groove will have reached the bottom of the tooth. Moving on from determining age, we will look at abnormal tooth conditions. So there are several factors that are going to influence the wear and the appearance of teeth. Um, a couple of these include bite, cribbing, bishoping, and then floating. So I touched briefly um, in one of our introductory slides on considering the anatomy and that continuous growth of the horse's teeth in the wear. So keep those factors in mind here, um, but we'll dig a little bit deeper into each of these. So first off, when we're looking um, at bite, we have horses that are either parrot-mouthed or monkey-mouthed. So parrot-mouthed is shown in that upper right-hand photograph. Um, this is going to be the result of the upper and lower incisors not meeting because the lower jaw is going to be too short, so it's going to be an overbite. It is also going to affect the molars, um, then sharp points and hooks may form during wear. This condition is rather common and may seriously interfere with the horse's ability to graze. So parrot mouth, this overbite, is going to be common in horses and may interfere with their ability to graze. Um, when we look at horses that are monkey mouthed, so monkey mouth is going to be the opposite of parrot mouth. So it is going to be an underbite. And monkey mouth is going to be seldom seen in horses. So parrot mouth is very common, and monkey mouth is seldom seen. Um, next, when we're considering horses that crib. 
So cribbing is going to be a habit that is common to stabled horses that damage the incisors by chipping or breaking them. So if you see a horse that oftentimes are going to latch on to wooden surfaces, for example, if you have a wood plank fence, um, may latch on to their buckets, but they can also do this to metal objects. So they are going to literally bite down on that object and then they're going to inhale air, so forcing air. Um, and this is what we refer to as gripping, cribbing. It is a vice, it's not desirable. Um, we do have a couple of horses here at the university that crib. Um, and these horses, you may see them wearing cribbing collars, so collars around their necks. Um, and this is going to prevent um, that vice or that um, learned behavior. Moving on from cribbing, because cribbing is going to result or can result in abnormal tooth conditions. Um, moving on to that, we have floating. So floating is going to be largely used to manage and maintain our horse's um, dental health per se. Floating is sometimes called dental reduction or dental equilibrium, which means to file or smooth the points, the hooks, or ramps on teeth to facilitate chewing. So when we talk about points, points are going to be sharp tooth projections on the inside of the lower jaw near the tongue and on the outside of the upper jaw near the cheek from normal dental wear. So points are going to occur naturally from how the horse wears their teeth. Um, hooks are going to be sharp projections on the front of the upper row of the jaw or on the back of the bottom row of the jaw. Whereas a ramp is a sloping surface that can have sharp edges on the premolars or the molars of the jaw. These points, hooks, and ramps can all cause tongue or cheek injury. So when our horses um, have these points, hooks, or ramps, we're going to float our horse's teeth um, to prevent, to maintain, to make it more comfortable for the animal. On the lower right hand photograph, um, this is Katie Logston. She is actually a graduate of Western Kentucky University. And after completing her degree at Western, um, she went to be certified in equine dentistry in Colorado um, and trained under Um, Dr. Kustra, who does the floating on our university horses. Um, so Katie Logston is performing a float um, to the animal at the university farm, that lower right-hand photograph. Um, and then finally, we want to talk about bishoping. So bishoping is the act of changing the appearance of the horse's teeth to make the horses appear younger. Um, clearly, this is not a process um, that is ideal or promoted. Um, this process can involve such processes as filing down the Galvain's groove or changing the shape or length of the teeth um, or using silver nitrate to artificially create cups. This is going to be a dishonest practice that does not reverse other signs of aging that are shown in the enamel rings. The shape of the pulp cavity and the smooth tabled incisors to make the new cups which are then blackened with wearing surface or the angle of the incisors from the side. Um, so again, bishoping is going to be a dishonest practice, um, not something that is recommended or suggested by any means. And then finally, um, other indicators of age. So aside from having good records and then considering that teeth are going to be the best estimate of age um, following good records, we also have a couple of other indicators that we can evaluate. So the features of older horses are a little bit like those of older people per se. So the sides of the face may become more depressed, the pole may become more prominent, and then the hollows above the eyes become deeper. 
Um, the backbone is also be going to become more prominent and begin to sag. So these are our horses that we may consider sway-backed um, in age. And then the joints are going to appear more angular, as well as around the eyes, temples, nostrils, and elsewhere, white hairs may begin to appear. This will now complete your week 5A lecture on determining age within the horse, and you will now be ready to complete week 5A assignment.